So now we'll turn things over to Adrian Otto. Adrian's a distinguished architect here at Rackspace, working among other things, working on among other things, OpenStack Magnum. And feel free to add whatever uh, details you like around your bio. That's good enough. Take it away. All right, so I'm not from Austin. I was born in California, and I've been there ever since. I even went to college in California. Um, but I do get a chance to come out here about once a month. I've been um, a racker since 2007. I've been to Texas 92 times. 92 times. So um, I feel like I live in Texas. How do you know that? How do you know? I, have, I have every expense report filed. So thank you, Rackspace, for letting me rack up lots and lots of miles going back and forth in California to Texas. <laughs> well said, y'all. Um, and so when I talk about containers, I make the point that this is the most disruptive technology that has arrived since the innovation of virtualization, when that became commercially available about 12 years ago. And when that happened, it changed the way we thought about computing, how we manage servers, how we package software, and now we have an opportunity to innovate on all of those things all over again. So today, you can use the cloud to produce a virtual machine that runs a workload and you can pay for it by the hour. And with the advent of containers as a hosted service in the cloud, you can run workloads that are much more ephemeral in nature, start up much more quickly, and that you may be able to buy by the minute or by the second. And Rackspace is working with a service you probably have heard about called Karina. That's currently in beta release, and it's based on an OpenStack infrastructure. And you can sign up for free at getkarina.com. We also offer this on private clouds as well. And that is in a by invitation only beta. And it uses the technology that I'm going to show to you today. So our expertise in containers comes from working on uh, a variety of different softwares in building the uh, basis for Karina, in working on Magnum, and in managing our environments. We work with all of these technologies and have combined them all into services to help you make this tech more accessible. So in this talk, <clears throat> I'm going to explain a little bit about kind of Magnum and what are the, what are the highest level features of what, what is it for. I'm going to talk a little bit about the different container orchestration engines and how they're different from each other and why people want a choice. I'll talk about managing clusters with Magnum and you'll have an opportunity to pummel me with questions. So Magnum is an OpenStack service. It is one of uh, many that are actually not even shown here. There are more than 20 OpenStack services. It's uh, one that is built on a number of others. So Magnum actually is built on top of Heat, um, which uses Nova and Neutron and Keystone and Glance and a number of other projects. So it's deeply integrated into the OpenStack service ecosystem. In 2014, we added Magnum to OpenStack as a service. And it gives you this ability to create a container cluster of your own, which we call a bay. So a bay is a place where your container orchestration software runs. And you get a choice today of whether you're going to run a Docker cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, or a Mesos cluster. And these are all kind of built in so that you can just order them up by, by name. And you'll see how this works. But OpenStack also gives you the ability to choose running workloads on 
virtual machines or on bare metal. So Magnum is designed to take advantage of that as well. So we have different templates that are used for deploying on a virtualized environment and another set that are used for deploying onto a bare metal environment. It's a community development effort. It, there are, are a number of tags on OpenStack projects that indicate various things about them. One of the tags is called team diverse, diverse team or team diversity. And projects with that tag are unique in that if any single sponsor stops working on the project for any reason, it would be expected to continue and not, uh, and not suffer. And Magnum is one of these that carries this, this designation. And so it's seen, um, you know, a lot of projects, if I, you were to look at the pie chart of who contributes to the project are dominated by one color. And they're kind of sprinkled in with a, a little bit of others. Um, but there are a few projects that see, um, you know, a broad base of support and this is one of them. So if you're an IT executive or manager or architect and you're making a decision about what container technology you're going to use to offer to your users so that they can run, they can run the next generation of applications in your infrastructure. You take on a risk in the choice that you make because you're going to be locking yourself in to that choice. And Magnum frees you from this risk in allowing you to offer a variety of container technologies concurrently to your users so that you don't have to bet the farm on one. Magnum is built on a fundamental design principle that everything from the top to the bottom should be multi-tenant. And that there should be proper isolation both from a security perspective and from a performance perspective so that workloads don't interfere with each other. And if you trust that a hypervisor is going to keep one workload in one VM separated from another workload in another VM, then you can also trust Magnum to separate your workloads in the same way, because that's exactly how we do it. We don't put the same users' containers on the same kernels together. We group them in this construct that I talked about, the Bay construct. We give you the ability to choose your container orchestration engine. So by default, we support Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, and Apache Mesos all built in. And you can run them all side by side concurrently in the same user and the same cloud, belonging to the same tenant, all properly isolated from each other. You also can decide to run your workloads either on virtual machines or bare metal, or the way Rackspace has done it is even a step more complicated than that in that the instances themselves are containers, not virtual machines. So we run containers within containers, which may also be possible with Magnum at some point. And Magnum is deeply integrated with OpenStack. So the same user credentials that you use to say, give me a cloud server or give me a storage volume are the same credentials that you would use to create a bay or a container cluster in Magnum. So let's talk about some of those container engines for a minute. So Docker Swarm has a concept of a manager, sometimes referred to as a master. This is where the API calls are handled. It essentially works like an API load balancer. So requests that come into the Swarm Manager are directed to one of the Swarm nodes. So the Swarm nodes are what actually run the workloads. So if you say run a container, that request goes through the Swarm Manager and uh, actually gets started on one of the Swarm nodes. So the Swarm Manager learns about where the actual Swarm nodes are through a discovery service. By default, if you don't specify one, it uses the, the Docker public registry, but it can also use etcd, it can use console, it can use a variety of different discovery services because it's pluggable. 
And essentially, the Docker daemons make themselves registered with the Swarm server so that they, so the membership is now known. And once that's known, the Swarm daemon can do the dispatch that I'm talking about. That's how it works. So Kubernetes has some similarities. It also has a centralized um, API service, which contains a variety of components. It also has the concept of nodes. There's a service that runs on every node called a kubelet. And it also has a, a proxy service that runs on each node. And every single one of the nodes also runs a container execution engine. The most common one is Docker. And that's where your workloads run. Now, Kubernetes is a bit more sophisticated uh, than Docker Swarm in its current state. It allows you to do much more sophisticated policies that determine like, if a portion of your application fails, what should the recovery policy be, right? It can automatically start containers that, that suddenly stop. It allows you to have scaling policies. Um, it has a very uh, comprehensive strategy for allowing you to do software deployments, rolling, uh, rolling deployments, canaries, uh, A-B deployments, all sorts of really cool stuff. Apache Mesos is the oldest of the um, of the COEs that are out there. Let's see here. It was about nine years ago that it came on the scene. By comparison, Docker just had its third birthday. Kubernetes is about two years old now. So from a maturity perspective, it's, it's much more mature. But it wasn't designed to be a container management system to begin with. It's an infrastructure management system or a job management system fundamentally. Um, but it's very pluggable, and it has a lot of different frameworks that it can run. Um, and it can run these various frameworks, again, simultaneously side by side. So you can have, like, um, say, a, a patchy, uh, what's it called? No, not Zookeeper. Hadoop. Hadoop running on one. You can have Kronos running on another. Right? You can have Marathon running on another. All these different frameworks all existing so, uh, concurrently in the, same, in the same infrastructure. It also has this concept of a, of a highly, available, um, highly available service. So it has a Zookeeper cluster that it uses for membership to, to keep the service online. And it has a concept of both leader and standby nodes. It also has this concept of an offer. So a, a executor right, within a framework can offer capacity to the cluster, and the cluster can offer, or the, the a Mesos master can offer work to the executors. And so there's basically this chatter, this back and forth negotiation of, hey, I have capacity. Hey, I have work to do. And these things are matched up. So why? Why do three different container orchestration systems exist today? Why, are, why isn't there just one? And the reason is they're good at different things. So if you are a big data shop, you've got a million dollars worth of hardware running Hadoop, chances are you're probably going to want a, a relatively sophisticated container orchestration engine. You probably wouldn't pick Swarm. You probably would prefer Kubernetes or maybe Apache Mesos, depending on your scale. If you, um, you know, you're just taking your first step into container tech and you're not re ready to go all the way to, to Kubernetes or, or Mesos, but you want some kind of like a step in the right direction, you might choose to use Docker Swarm to begin with and start using like system style containers before you get to full blown application containers. So you might prefer that for some of your more basic workloads. And then you might have, say, a cloud native application that is totally designed from scratch to be containerized, to run on the cloud, to be in a, in a um, microservices architecture, in which case you might prefer that it be on something like Kubernetes. So let's talk about how Magnum makes these available to you. So Magnum, like I mentioned, is an API service that allows you to create these, these container clusters. And it's different from just taking some machines and slapping a COE on top, 
But if you just take a pile of machines and put Kubernetes on top, you're basically locked into using that for that entire capacity. Or if you slap Docker Swarm on top, you're locked into it. And if you want to change the um, amount of infrastructure that you use for Swarm versus the amount of infrastructure that you use for Kubernetes, that's going to be a very manual process. With Magnum, you can use your Keystone credentials to produce your container clusters. Right? So you don't need to have yet another username, yet another password. It's the same cloud account that you have for OpenStack works for this. I mentioned it being designed from the ground up to be multi-tenant so that both the data plane and the control plane, both, are isolated from each other per bay. You can have different types running simultaneously side by side. So a swarm cluster with two Kubernetes clusters side by side, totally easy. They're isolated from each other using groups of Nova instances, which I'll illustrate in a sec. And when you want to say you're, you're happy with Docker, say, 110, and you want to move to Docker 112, how do you do that today in your container environments? You run APT, or you run YUM, and you try to upgrade it in place, and it like breaks and nothing happens and like you bring all of your workloads down and you're like, oh my God, everything is broken right now. And you kind of freak out and then until you finally figure out what's wrong and you get all your things and you kind of rebuild all your containers from scratch and re-import all of your data from backups and then you're back up and running again. That's kind of the, that's kind of the upgrade path right now when you upgrade Docker on most OSs. Um, but if you had a system that made it really easy to make another cluster with a command or two, then you could just start your containers on a new cluster and let the old one die out. So when I say COE, I mean container orchestration engine. This is a term that the Magnum team dreamed up all on their own. Nobody else says COE except for us. And the reason why is that nobody else is trying to abstract this concept. They're, they've all picked their favorite, right? The Kubernetes community, just the COE is Kubernetes. In the Docker community, the COE is Docker Swarm or, or Docker 112, and that's it. Nobody else is trying to offer these as a choice. So we had to make up our own name, and that's what it is. So when I say that, you think it's one of these three things. When I say bay, I mean a COE cluster. So if I say a Docker Swarm bay, I mean a Swarm cluster. We had just decided today, we were having our mid-cycle meetup, meet and we decided we're going to get rid of the bay name and we're just going to call it cluster, because it is what it is. But for now, it's called bay. So the bay is where your container orchestration engine runs, and it runs on top of a Nova instance. So you can have an arbitrary number of these instances underneath your bay, so they can scale out or it can scale up or down. The bay is a grouping of these things that is unique for that user and tenant, or unique per tenant, I should say. And the COE runs on top of that bay. So every single node in that bay is running some aspect of the COE, either a master or a slave, or in some cases, both. So a bay model is like a template for creating a bay. So it's like the default settings for if you create a bay, these are all the things that are going to, and you'll see exactly what these look like. But you can think of it as the, the template that you use to stamp these out. When I say native client, I mean the client software that is native to the COE. So in the case of Swarm, it's Docker. In the case of Kubernetes, it's kubectl, or kubectl, depending on what your religion is. Um, it does not mean native to OpenStack. It means native to the COE. Now, the things you can do with Magnum, you can set up bay models and do CRUD on them. You can set up bays and do CRUD on them. You can get the certificate authority from, for the bay, you can sign certificates, 
and you can see the service status. And that's it. It doesn't do anything else. Now why does Magnum have a get CA cert and a sign TLS cert function? Why would we need that? We need that because all of the different components of the COE use cryptography as the access control mechanism. We're using TLS in order to authorize the different system, the different parts of the system, because they can potentially be running on public networks, and we're not going to use OpenStack credentials in order to interact with your legacy container tools, right? Or I shouldn't say legacy, I should say your native container tools. But there's a bunch of things that Magnum even used to do, but doesn't do anymore, intentionally. It does not allow you to act on any container at all. You can't create a container, you can't modify a container, you can't delete a container, you can't tag a container, you can't pull a container, you can't do any of that stuff. Because you use the native client for all of that. You only use the, the Magnum client to create the bay, and then once you have the bay, you jump to using whatever your native client is, and it's the native experience. When you create a bay from a bay model, there's one thing they have in common, which is this ID. So the bay model has this ID, and when you create a bay from it, it's going to have a matching ID. It contains a bunch of other stuff, too. So in the bay model, it has all of the things that are going to be in common between all the bays that you create. One of those things is like, what glance image should I use to produce the Nova instances underneath? What should the uh, COE be? Is this going to be a swarm bay? Is it going to be a Kubernetes bay? What kind of bay is it going to be? It also has like, what flavor should I make the master? What flavor should I make the, uh, the nodes that run the actual container workloads? So I'm going to give you a two minute and 17 second demonstration of what it looks like. Ready? All right, so if you like that video, you can see it on the project page. Can we, uh, can we get it? You'll see, I'll break it down, and I have 40 slides here, so you'll, you'll see it.
You like that, huh? It's called vertical or something, yeah. Anyway, um, resources in Magnum have, uh, have a life cycle. This is, these are the different states that you can see uh, a bay will go through. When you first start a bay, it'll go into create in progress state. Uh, when it's done, you see create complete. If you change something about the bay, like you scale it, right? Say, add a node or subtract a node or something. Uh, it'll enter update in progress state, and when it's done, you get update complete. And you can do that multiple times. And if you delete a bay, it'll go into delete in progress state, and I think by the time it reaches deleted, it vanishes from the list, so you don't see it anymore. So if you log into a, uh, a Magnum system, the first thing you need to do is create these things called bay models. And chances are your service provider um, or if you are the service provider, you'll want to create these in advance so your users don't need to do this. But these will be uh, loaded by default, uh, typically by your service provider, so it's all set up. And all you need to do once a bay model exists is just create bays. So if you look at the bay model itself, it's like I showed you before. These are all the things that you need in order to configure your bay to work in your environment, right? What what storage driver you're going to use, um, what the fixed network is on your, on your Neutron network, what the DNS configuration should be, all that sort of thing. If you created bays and you run Magnum Bay List, it'll show you each bay, its name, its UUID, how many nodes are in it um, for running containers and how many nodes are in it for the actual master search. So, Every bay can be multi-master, so you can create a multi-master Kubernetes and load balance the um, API traffic across them. And that's just a setting of a single, a single um, value on the bay create. So you just say the master count should be two, and you get a multi-master setup. And that's it. There's nothing special to do. If you show a bay, You'll see the addresses of the nodes that are in it, what its master address is. So you'll notice that the master address and the API address are, are similar. So if you wanted to connect to this thing using a Docker client, you would set your, your Docker host to this value with TCP at the front. I'll, sh I'll show you more about this in a sec. If you want to create a different BAME model, you can do that as well. These are the settings. When it's time to create a bay, you just give it a name and tell it what bay model to use and how many nodes should be in it. So this is what it would look like for creating a swarm bay. And this is how you create a swarm bay. If you want to scale a bay, you just change the attribute called node count to the number of nodes that you want it to be. So if this was five and I set the value of two, it would, would reduce it by three. If it were one and I set it to do, it would add one. So it's the desired state. If you want to hook your native client up, all you need is the, a working uh, TLS certificate set in order to interact with it. Now you can, there are two ways to do this. One way is you just copy them off the, uh, the bay node. Another way to do it is you can, you can generate and sign the certificate using the CA, using the uh, CA show and the CA sign methods that I talked about earlier. And then once you have uh, those cert files in a directory where your client knows to find them, you say, uh, use, set the Docker host to the API address of the bay. and change HTTPS to TCP. So this is just a script that does exactly that. So in review, to look at your bay models, you use bay model list. To create a bay, you, give it a, you use bay create, you give it a name and what bay model it belongs to, and how many nodes you want that cluster to be. If you want to see all of your clusters, you use bay list. And if you want to change the number of nodes, you do an update like this. 
And if you want to show an individual bay, you can do a base show. That's basically it. It's all there is to Magnum. So I talked about Magnum and why it makes sense versus just picking one container tech. I talked about the different container orchestrations and why multiples exist, kind of why people choose one versus another. I talked about the commands that you would use to manage a container cluster with Magnum. And here we are. 